Is she sitting pretty? Can she see you? Great. What would a presentation on toys and toy research be without toys? It's astonishing um, the many toy conferences I've joined in the world, how little people actually bring toys to those events and conferences. Yet we are talking about material things for play, which need this tangible engagement with in order to be fully understood and grasped as objects of play. For this and for many other reasons, I usually travel with my toys. I call that toy tourism or toy traveling. They also are sort of my avatars. They represent different aspects of me. And uh, please say hello to my little friends. These are my ugly dolls who you can see have traveled vastly with me around the globe, one could say. And I have a nice anecdote, uh, which is very telling in regard to how important these toys are for me. Um, I was once photo playing, and that means photographing the toys at a, a canal bank in Finland. And uh, I placed the toys on a pedestal to photo play with them. And of course I needed to pose them first, because for, that, uh, for me that is play. And suddenly one of them fell down from the pedestal from the pole, the wooden thing, and started rolling towards the water, the bank of the river, or small canal. And I thought that if it ends up in the water, I will for sure dive in to get it. <laughs> Luckily it didn't happen, it just stayed like this, very close to fall down. But uh, these have become important objects for me, like I said, for many reasons. and. Uh, Although they are dirty, although you, you can see the traces of play with them, no matter of that, or because of that, they have that certain glow to them. And glow is also one of the aspects of how I have theorized my own understanding of toy experiences and toy relationships people have with their toys. Uh, say hello to Lola, one of my blight dolls, who functions sort of my avatar. She is also a little bit worn out. You can see uh, traces on her face. She has fallen from many stones and other places where I have posed her. Nevertheless, these toys will be watching you. I will be watching the toys watching you. And this is play, also play of the mind that goes on. And I'd like to uh, start this presentation by inviting you all uh, to a little bit of make-believe because um, one could approach these play research methods camps also as a very serious event. A serious event in that sense that once you get invited to this kind of happening, you, you sort of uh, need to have some kind of seriousness also to, to the topics you're covering also. Most importantly, the way you are covering these topics because you uh, are supposed to be an expert. So, uh, I started by making uh, this presentation uh, into something that could perhaps um, show a book cover from the Wow, Flow and Glow, which referred to uh, my theorizing of the toy experiences and toy relationships of adults, to the how, the mastering the art and methods of studying toy play. This sounds like a very festive approach. <laughs> uh, gives you sort of the picture that you know it all. Um, let's continue this game of make-believe for a moment. So, if I had this kind of a book upcoming, I would say that this presentation or book approaches play and play things from the following methodological perspective. The principles of studying play or playful engagement, the hybridity of play or hybridity of play materials, and the generations of players. I would claim that play with things is understood in the book as interaction enabled both by the affordances and the socially negotiated rules of engagement with its things. 
I would tell you that uh, I've conducted play tests with preschoolers. I have been photo playing with all kinds of uh, audiences of different ages. Also, during one play session with over 100 seventh graders, which are teenagers, not so willing to play with toys. But I've done that. And at the same time, uh, done some participatory observation, of course, visual documentation and group interviews with the participants. Also participants at play dates with adult toy players, um, which during these play dates exemplify the ways in which interaction with toys may be studied. I would of course show you in the book um, how I done group interviews and play tests with these five to six year old children who have witnessed a Hatchimal hatch out of its egg and seen their excitement and enthrallment and probably got a lot of negative uh, negativity caused that in their families when they have started to beg for one Hatchimal of their own. Uh, the story doesn't tell which, uh, how many have gotten that after we play tested, nevertheless. Or I would tell the story of the adult toy players <laughs> who gather in each other's homes to these play dates and do things with toys that they don't necessarily always refer to play activities, but as hobbies, most uh, related to hobbying. I would also point out in this volume that the matters of play we study today do not limit themselves to physicality. Obviously, technologies extend play, and social media platforms, as well as social media entertainment, offer a lot of material to study toy play from the perspectives of serial and shared photo play, that is toy photography, and play videos. Moreover, um, I would tell about the analysis of these audiovisual traces of play and what they offer in terms of insights of how an integral role technology plays in our relationships, engagement with, and the play knowledge preserved through these interactions with toys. <coughs> I would also probably tell a little bit of my latest work interested in transgenerational play, that is play between generations, that play is, seems to become an intergenerational thing. Um, for example, interaction between young children and seniors could be approached through sharing of play memories, through storytelling, and by using a designerly intervention based on the activity of co-designing toys. This is also what I have been experimenting with. So, uh, this is an interactive boot camp uh, format, an interactive presentation as well. So close your eyes for a moment and reflect back upon a really, really strong memory of play, either with toys or without them, with other people or um, as solitary play. Think about that for a moment. Could be a game, could be an app, could be a toy, could be a playground. Thank you. In the following, I'd like to share one of these strong play moments that I myself experienced a couple of weeks back in Moscow, photo playing on the Red Square. I think this photograph is absolutely brilliant because it also gives you the picture of, of uh, how authorities can potentially uh, be uh, harassed by the fact that you are playing in places in public space and with toys as an adult. Think of that. <laughs> So I have purchased one of these Russian dolls and I wanted to do photo play with it in front of a basilic. And uh, my host, who took me around places in Russia, uh, she was kind enough to take this photograph 
And I said, I find it brilliant because um, you, have, you can see the Russian police car there. You can get a sense of the context. Mm -hmm. But most of all, that fantastic character there standing in the rain. Doesn't he look like Voldemort or something? <laughs> <laughs> so this gives you an idea of that there's always people watching your play, no matter where you do it. And uh, this um, may or may not uh, restrict your play patterns, your play behavior. So a great picture, a really, really a uh, moment to treasure. Next, uh, I would like to point out that what I just told you about the book is still very festive, very much unapproachable, because, of course, this was a game of make-believe. There uh, isn't a volume coming. There might be someday. Not now, however. I was toying, playing with the idea of such a volume. I definitely think that we should have this kind of a book coming out. Maybe there's something we can work upon. But play, most centrally, most basically, is something that needs to be messed with in order to understand it. You need to take risks. You need to play with uncertainty. Play is about living uh, with uncertainties, with uh, possibilities. Look at this picture. Um, is it a moment where the child is given the teddy bear or is, is the adult trying to tug the teddy bear out of the child's hands to get it for him or herself? This just gives you an idea that play needs to be messed with, play asks to be messed with in order so that we can understand more. We can write a lot about uh, theories of play. We can write a lot about the method methodologies of how to study play. But in the end, one needs to experience play of oneself in order to, to understand what it can be about. So I um, also thought that um, you should be involved in play and you should toy with materials, you should have something to fiddle with during the day. And I have uh, brought with me some materials for that. You have uh, scissors and felted pens on the tables. And I will hand out a couple of these on each table. You may use multiple of the formats that you see on the other side, or just one. And I have an exercise that I will explain to you later on. However, now you can start to toy with the materials as you please and as we uh, go on I will tell you more about it. playing with toys, would you believe me? Well, I can tell you a little bit uh, about how I, um, I ca came to realize that um, there are rules, because rules emerge once we interact with people, with objects, with systems, 
when we are playing. So what a misconception it was for myself that when I made the decision of uh, jumping from uh, board game design and the world of games into the world of toys, that there would be no rules whatsoever. Little did I know. So uh, what was pro the, probably the most telling artifact or, or interactive installation that has told me this and teach me this, that there are ultimately rules to open-ended or unstructured play, is that people will start to make the rules pretty fast, also when engaging with physical materials. So this is a sandbox installation I did, uh, most probably in 2012, a pink sandbox filled with colored dice. So the colors, is, uh, those are the only pieces of information on the plastic dies. And that's a, an altogether other story that we don't have time to go more deeply into here. But I'd like to refer to this piece, which is also called There Are No Rules, uh, as a, a method of understanding how rules eventually emerge also in toy play. So, jumping from my make-believe make -believe slides of the uh, imagined volume, a continu continuation perhaps to my doctoral thesis, to the actual content of the presentation today, is uh, to completely uh, reconfigure uh, the presentation and retitle it and uh, write here how to investigate play and uh, maybe to your disappointment also <laughs> to reveal the fact that I'm still wondering about the methods myself. Um, obviously I need to experiment with play. I need to play more to find out more. I need to get more toys. I need to play with more people to understand it. So these would be my confessions. Who is still wondering as a toy researcher about several things in play. But you already heard that I have a background in uh, board game design and that stems from the fact that uh, my grandfather started a board game company in Finland in the late 60s. And I worked there as a designer for several years uh, after which I uh, stepped into academia and did some studies on research on games, but I quickly came to the realization that coming from a game company, one needs to have a thing of your own too if you want to want to uh, get to other areas, <coughs> and I, I thought that toys would be my thing. So I got to uh, start my doctoral research on toys, and I specifically concentrated on adult toy play. And uh, I can now circulate my doctoral thesis. This already came up in 2013, so a long time ago. Uh, a lot of things have happened after that. But nevertheless, it gives you a picture of, of how you, um, as a student of uh, visual culture, can make a thesis of adult toy play. Now I'm based at the University of Turku in an Academia Finland uh, funded project called the um, Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. And games again, yes, but I'm the only toy researcher there. Toy researcher also in, involved in ITRA, that is the International Toy Research Association. And since I've been born and bred in the toy industry, um, I have done a 20 year career or so in there. Um, and um, I'm involved in the Women in Toys organization. At the moment, I'm very interested in how toyification emerges in other areas of culture than the traditional realm of uh, play with toys, games, or related experiences. I have studied the toyification of fashion, the toyification of lifestyle products, the toyification of technology, just to mention a few examples of how I see that toys um, as aesthetic entities are functioning how uh, 
things are designed in other uh, areas as well. The world is being toyified as well as it is largely being gamified at the moment. But uh, toyification is different from gamification because it has that tangible element uh, and the um, idea of playfulness related to open-ended play with the endless possibilities of toying with the world. A couple of projects from the past because I want you to give a picture of to understand um, what kind of uh, interaction I have been uh, designing between players and, and objects I've, I've been involved with myself. So a little bit about board games, toyified board games, um, storybooks for children. Um, something that I want you to see as well because this goes with the rest of the presentation too. So, uh, something I toyed with in terms of uh, game pieces that I thought that would make a nice toy in themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, playful art installations. This is fine to be. Uh, probably uh, you as, as Danish people, most of all, are, um, are familiar with the concept of creating little animals out of pine cones or other cones out of trees. So that is a very, very traditional play thing in Finland as well. Something at least uh, elder generations are teaching the younger ones. So you can see this as a concept of transgenerational play as well. A um, little development of that as well. Some sort of play, toy tourism, uh, gamified cultural experiences with toys and photo play. And this has a little bit similarities to Pokemon Go. Uh, however, we launched our gamified uh, art experience a little bit before Pokemon. So, um, yeah, just a kid. Um, yeah, but we're toying with uh, AR there a bit as well. And last but not least, the intergenerational uh, experiments I have been doing in the past. So, how do I understand play? This is a long description that might well end up in the make-believe volume at some point. But um, I believe that, that play definitely belongs to all age groups. And we all know that play is useful. There's no question about that. And in the ludic age, or the age of the ludic turn, as Brian Sutton Smith calls it, uh, interaction, participation, and collective experiences have become goals in many cultural activities. And I believe playing together, of course, strengthens the collective spirit and elevates the experience beyond the mundane. Uh, we know that, um, of course, that animals play too. I've been able to witness some animals uh, interested in object play. And uh, it's also quite interesting to know that animals are the, um, um, or humans as animals are the only species who make toys for their, for their breed. So um, the cat playing with this uh, installment, it played a really long time with it, I must say. I was sitting at a cafe in Istanbul and just was fascinated uh, about this interaction. So clearly animals play with toys as well. Uh, we play because of biological needs, but also because of cultural um, needs and, and cultural things that we, we have become um, uh, we familiar with in our pasts. All, all the stories, everything that goes on in media ultimately becomes material for our play. Then I came across uh, this quote from Ian Bogost. When it comes to play, we give ourselves too much credit. The play is in the thing, not in us. This is quite a provocative thought. And that's something that we could be discussing here as well. Nevertheless, the human being represents the only species, as I said, which is known to make play objects to its offspring. And uh, although, like in this second quote, uh, playthings are referred to as, as objects to children, today toys may also be considered as playthings utilized in adult toy play. I already mentioned gamification, and you cannot neglect 
gamified play when you research toys. So it's very useful also to look at what goes on in the world of games when you look at toys. And this is all for social media. Um, you can look, look at social media platforms and you can quickly understand by turning to these resources and data that there are clearly patterns of play that emerge. So I claim that toy play is being gamified as we speak as well. Of course, the cultural significance of toys is large. And um, I believe that the functions of toys may only be understood by exploring them as a part of play. For the child, a toy may be the key to reality, whereas for an adult, it's an unreal object that lends to the world of fantasy. This is a Finnish uh, play researcher writing in 1997. The toy stories of both adults and children today that I have researched uh, reveal that uh, both kids and adults are acquiring toys, being creative with them, um, involved in both solitary and social playing, and are doing actually a lot of storytelling with the help of the toys. I already mentioned you photo play, and this would be one of my research methods as well. It's about interacting with toys, mostly in public spaces. It's about developing the toy stories, and it's about taking risks, not only with the toys, but also with the world. Is the world ready for a toy play or, um, adult who, who, who messes with the world by coming uh, to public spaces to interact with the playthings? It is important, of course, to stress, stress also that play develops alongside of technology. I already mentioned social media, but we can see that toys are uh, becoming more and more connected as well. So the internet of toys as an emerging phenomenon is another um, type of proof of uh, the hybridity of play and also um, <coughs> the fact that with, uh, with these internet of things kinds of objects, uh, content to play can be developed in a faster pace and feed fed to these objects that are in people's homes. And many risks have been discussed um, uh, in accordance or in um, reference to these kind of toys. But um, I have with my own colleague um, researched them mostly from the perspective of play. And we've done this with preschoolers through uh, different play testing group interviews and uh, such. And we have uh, found out that um, during these short playtest episodes, children have also been able to express very imaginative play patterns uh, in association with the toys. Uh, I can uh, mention a few of them. So a couple of these toys have been mentioned that they can teach the child how to fly. And uh, uh, then again, the dino toy you can see there in the corner, because it has a light inside of it, has been um, decided that can be used for practical things as well, such as using it uh, as a lamp in a tent. So children are really innovative in how they think about toys and how they quickly approach them and how they read their affordances and how they put these affordances into play. Uh, in my own work, I have then uh, made this visual visualization of how social media and games actually are uh, influencing a lot the uh, way we regard toys and, and uh, contemporary toy play. I, I can also see that uh, besides dolls, for instance, or other character toys becoming adult avatars, they are actually becoming construction toys in themselves. People are using a lot of time to customize toys too. And to personalize toys is actually something of interest for the toy industry as well. They are providing us possibilities 
of how to assemble toys in different ways. And I'm not talking about construction systems now. I'm talking about character toys. So clearly a trend, uh, clearly a way of reaching out to the playing audiences, of uh, enlarging, enlarging those affordances, how we can, how we can interact with the, the playthings. So uh, there's a part here in my presentation about good playthings. And this is a very recent um, research from my part, and I'll just very quickly <coughs> run through these slides. But I want to point out that here are some, maybe some points of interest for you when you um, use or toy with the material I just provided you with. So I have two concepts here, playability and play value. And uh, playability, of course, refers to that you can play with the object. Play value, again, may result from the dimensions of aesthetics, simplicity, versatility, pleasure, pleasurability, fun or amusement, educational potential, safety, durability, age appropriateness, ergonomics of use, and sustainability, just to mention a few. So there's a lot. But I'd like to uh, focus on playability as a concept and play value as a separate concept. Also, there is play knowledge. And here I want to um, show you a bit more about how I have uh, dealt with this topic. Um, I believe that play knowledge is partly tacit knowledge. It's something that needs to be shown to other people. It's embodied knowledge about playthings, among other, other things, but in terms of toys, how to manipulate different materials, how to... How to um, how to challenge the materials, how to add play value to the materials in play. So I uh, conducted this uh, experimental research with uh, 80 uh, plus years seniors and preschool aged children, and that in Finland means uh, children uh, aged 5 to 6. So in this particular study I used the same um, wooden components of which I ultimately created this, uh, this character myself. But I never told the groups to make such a cre uh, create, uh, creation or creature out of them. So I involved uh, ten, 10 children and 10 seniors at an elderly day center where the kindergarten people came to visit. And they met uh, three times. And I um, asked in my study how transgenerational play ideas emerge through toying with traditional play materials such as wood, and what part shared imagination plays in the process of generating ideas for play in relation to uh, do-it-yourself character creation. So this would be one of the methods I can, I can show you. And, um, it is experimental, of course. It's a tripartite do-it-yourself toy crafting and play situation with participatory observation, documentation, and qualitative group interviews. And it employs uh, all the research material collected during these three play sessions. So first, the children were paired up with a senior person. And they started the session by exchanging play knowledge. They talked about toy experiences with each other. And the children had actually bought their to toys with them, or some of them, and showed how they, how they could be played with. Uh, if they were character toys, which they were in many cases, uh, the backstory of these characters, and so on. And during the second session, um, they then started in these pairs to create these uh, wooden toys together. And during the third and final session, the child and senior pair uh, were reunited to investigate the co-created toy character, discuss its narrative dimension, and together imagine play patterns related to their toy character. And I believe this uh, represented interchange of play knowledge in connection to object play. Here you can see some of the creations they made. So not all of them look like the one I made. There are different solutions how to do this. Quite fantastic stories. And I believe that play knowledge may be shared between generations by this method of uh, show and tell the toy story. Also, um, in the 
in each other's diverse ways of playing because of older generations might be playing a little bit differently than we are. Uh, and then in the end, if you really approach these um, play patterns, they are quite similar. But um, different wordings might be used. And also, play knowledge may be generated by making toys together. Um, here is a chart I made about sharing of, of the play knowledge of, of, from the perspectives of both seniors and preschoolers. <coughs> and uh, this is work in progress. And I'm really happy to have involved these different age groups in this experimental um, project. So the conclusions. Um, Toy stories were exchanged, toy making skills shared, because the seniors uh, have made a lot of the toys um, themselves when they were kids. They have made this pine cone house, among other things, but also fiddled with other materials. Also, uh, everyday objects passed down when they're broken, like plates or so, to be used in their play. Also, guns, which they found in wartime Finland and such. So, <laughs> quite a thrill. I must say, um, but yeah, also um, uh, this gives an opportunity to see a growing realization on changes and similarities in the ludic aspect of childhood and materiali materiality in today's world. Another kind of, of way of uh, studying play. So uh, I tried to also include some of these theoretical thoughts that I developed along the way. I did this in my doctoral research, this um, conceptualization of the wow flow, uh, double wow, and the glow, or actually double wow came later on. So the thesis is divided in three parts, wow, flow, and glow, which refer to the uh, first stage is the wow, the enthrallment with the physical plating. The flow refers to the, um, the um, immersion, of, um, immersion in, in the play itself. The double wow, it's a secondary wow you discovered in play, and glow is something uh, that you give the toy, like I've given an additional glow to my character toys as they have traveled with me around the world. So you can you can tell from these toys that they have been played with. So I'd like to invite you to use this theoretical uh, thinking of the wow flow, double wow, and glow in how you uh, toy with the materials. And remember, this is only an invitation. So you cannot force anyone to play. You can only uh, invite them to do so. And uh, um, I wrote this uh, research paper on the universals of a toy design very recently and tried to make sense of my own, own uh, toy re uh, experience theory. And also this is work in progress. But I tried to uh, set up the uh, elemental questions for toy design. I've uh, looked at the dimensions of the toy experience, which I, like in the uh, four um, shown visualizations, see as physical, functional, fictive, and affective, and the dimensions of the play experience, which I understand as the wow, flow, double wow, and glow. And then uh, also I've included the concept of uh, play value here, which needs to be approached from perhaps the objective play value and subjective play value. So these are ideas of how to, how to deal with toy experiences and of course the experience of toy play. So um, um, I've uh, done this workshop earlier where I've asked people to, by or using this material, to think of a um, plaything of their choice. That can also be a game or an app, anything you can toy with. Uh, how is it playable? And what kind of play value does it involve? And then using the remaining six sides of the object, perhaps, or what you decide to do with it, to reflect upon the wow, glow, secondary wow and glow aspects of that particular plaything. So the materials I provided you with um, function as a three-dimensional piece, if you so like, to reflect upon these conceptual ideas. And this is, again, an invitation to think of play research 
and uh, perhaps a method of uh, studying toys. And I uh, call this a comic cubes tool, and it has a uh, function as quite a nice, nice methodological tool, but also most of all a prototyping tool uh, that can be used for designing new toys, but also to approach these conceptual understandings of play things and play. Again, an exercise uh, with rules, if you so like. Think of a plaything of your own choice. Consider its playability and play value. Uh, apply the theoretical ideas on the dimensions of the toy experience, which would be physicality, functionality, fictionality, and affectivity. Then use the reverse side of the prototyping tool to think of the dimensions of the play experience. Um, about the functionality, that has puzzled me a lot with toys because that has to do obviously with their playability and that is a huge and important question. So toys uh, are function functional uh, case by case. Different toys function in different ways. They are functional in play but they are functional in different ways. Uh, for instance, um, I've learned myself through play knowledge uh, that the knees of this light doll bend really well. Uh, before I had an understanding of this affordance, she always used to sit like this. But then during one of these play dates, because they were stiffer in the uh, beginning, then during one of these play dates, one of the other adults told me, please, please just go ahead and try to bend them like do it really hard and they will bend, and ultimately I got them to bend. <laughs> so, so this is play knowledge. During that same uh, play date, uh, this person also uh, told uh, other joining people who, uh, in which way you can change the eye chips of the doll, but that, that is a really violent procedure. So I, <laughs> I won't uh, show you that now. But she was turning her doll into Laura Palmer, so she needed the, like white eyes for the doll, and she managed quite well. I have picture evidence of that. So um, I'd also, um, besides uh, reflecting upon this transgenerational research uh, method, wanted to show you uh, to conclude a little bit uh, about the vastness of material that I've come across and, and done research with during my years as a toy researcher, particularly interested in adult toy play, and also to prove you guys that, that adults are really interacting with these character toys, which would be dolls, action figures, and soft toys. And uh, here, a little bit of uh, thinking on play as well. I think this is a really useful way of thinking about play. We, we do not need play in order to to like, prove ourselves of something that we already know, but to find out something that we don't know yet about. And Brian Sutton Smith thinks that playing is what people do when they create culture. Based on my uh, play knowledge concept, I would also say that playing is what people do when they preserve culture. So that's uh, embedded, uh, that's um, like embodied knowledge, tacit knowledge that we pass <laughs> on to next generations. Adult play, what is it? There's a multiplicity of perspectives. Now the toy industry is, is uh, starting to grasp the fact that adults are staying younger, longer. But there are negative uh, thoughts around this development as well, such as the belief that culture is becoming infantilized. Uh, like um, Larry Bernstein from Hasbro said in 1998 that collectors are a pimple on the elephant's ass. Now that pimple is becoming significantly bigger and um, us uh, kiddos are, are clearly um, um, being celebrated nowadays also by the toy industry. We believe that there's an age compression going on and in fact um, Euro monitors Data shows that kiddles is a growing three times as fast as, as other consumer groups of toys. And kiddles are buying for themselves, so price is not an issue. And of course, usually this is referred to as collecting, but believe me, it is play what they are doing. 
So I have been writing a lot on this uh, because I find it irritating and dismissive uh, in terms of play that adults wouldn't be playing, that it, it's, it's just a hobby. Uh, well, it can be that as well, but I think that it's all, it only referring them to the fact that we are doing something during leisure time. However, it's not explicated what we are doing or collecting. It's not just pure accumulation of objects. It's interacting with these objects in many ways. And there's this whole body of research on playfulness as well. Uh, for the uh, sake of clarity, I understand playfulness as an attitude and play as an activity. But other researchers have touched upon this division as well. And here's some theorizing around playful adults. Of course, um, we can go beyond toys, um, leisure, sports, games, obviously. Art and the toy friends of different kind. And as you can see, uh, sex toys are actually also being toyified if we think about like traditional um, visual and, and color schemes for toys and the, the aesthetics of uh, these kind of play aids, if you'd like. But then again, uh, the world of fiction is toying with toys as well. Mm. And we can see that in different times, play may manifest in a variety of ways. And uh, we can talk about the playing of games or other types of play when we want to accentuate one thing over another. So we already touched upon this um, aspect of play that the toy playing child, um, the play thing may be a key to reality. It's a simulation of the real world. For the adult, uh, on the other hand, um, it may well be a portal to, to the worlds of fantasy, and in many cases it is, but it can be something that has to do with reality as well. I love this uh, conversation from the Lego movie, where Dad and Finn are talking about Lego and how it is um, seen from these different perspectives. So very complex things we are dealing with. So I'm still uh, very intrigued by these questions. Which adults are playing with toys? In which ways are adults playing with toys? And where are they playing? And in this uh, doctoral thesis, I divided the adult toy players into collectors, toy designers, artists, toy and everyday players, which are the everyday people who do not have professional, reason, professional reasons to, to toy with uh, playthings. And of course, this uh, are not strict categories, and uh, they um, case by case sometimes uh, <coughs> go a little bit like this. So um, not strict, but in any way, uh, way of profiling largely the toy players. So in my research, I'm mostly looking at the play products, play, and and very much from um, the angle of social media. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what I call this is the ecosystem of contemporary play, but I've uh, grown uh, very fond of this new term, uh, the super system of play. I, I will start using that shortly. And uh, the focus is on contemporary toys with a face. And uh, I also had the possibility to ask once uh, Howard Rockman, who was then the head of uh, Lucas Licensing, about how consciously our new Star Wars toys developed with the adult player in mind. And he answered like this, the adults would certainly not admit to play with the toys. When the products are right for kids, the products are also right for adult collectors. Well, this is of course uh, true, because adults like the same toys as kids do. Many adults love Lego, as we know, that they call themselves, as we are also, many of you might know, AFOL, adult fans of Lego. So there we can see a little bit different kind of theoretical or rhetorical approach. The fans. Fandom is very, very positive towards play. Fandom is play. And fandom, of course, involves a lot of collecting. But as I said, I believe that collecting these toys is not all there is to it. Toys are also used to skill building um, as they are used 
uh, to play out fantastical scenarios and world building. And uh, recently I also did a study about how, how people, in which ways they describe toys as interesting objects. Um, this is upcoming, but I tried to um, use my theory of physicality, fictionality, functionality and affectivity in uh, going through this research material. And there's proof of that toys are liked, liked because all of these things, also disliked. Um, when we talk about play, it is of course um, it is of course something that is challenging in that sense that that play is ephemeral. However, I would once again like to stress out the fact that play leaves traces. It leaves traces on material objects, but also on social media platforms. So those would be the places we could go into to look at adult uh, interaction with toys. And uh, it is also important to notice that 21st century toy play may be viewed as an oculocentric, technologically enhanced and story-driven practice when you look at it from particularly the perspective of adults. Okay, uh, to conclude soon, uh, some examples of case studies, and now it gets more visual and perhaps more more interesting in that sense, but I've uh, involved a lot of uh, materials related to photo play, which, like I said earlier, is one of my methods I'm using. It happens indoor, indoors and outdoors, in domestic and public spaces, offline and online, in fantasy and reality. Uh, the context differ, could be artists, toying, artists using toys as a physical raw material or inspirational material. The everyday players take their toys everywhere. It is very much location-based play. It is mobile play. It is social play. And um, finally, some examples of case studies so that you get, can see the whole variety of uh, toy play of, of adults that I have been researching during the past years. So from the blind players, I've come to realize that their play patterns have to do with collecting, customization, identity play, world play, transmedia play, photo play, storytelling, and social play. They are also like avatars, and with that I mean that they are our minis. Here you can see Laura Palmer with her white, white eyes. So uh, from TV to doll dramas, adults are creating their own, own serial doll and toy narratives. And, sharing those on social media. But I find this fascinating too, that uh, known uh, scenes from uh, narrative um, storytelling from TV films are brought into toy play by adults. Toys on War is something uh, that I have been toying with myself to understand Finnish history in war uh, with Russia and um, I've uh, created these images based on true stories and, and photographs, uh, the, the one below, that was uh, taken of a Finnish uh, soldier bending over the dead body of a Russian woman soldier, uh, partly like uh, <coughs> naked. And uh, this is interesting because this could be also used as an educational tool um, when you recreate these scenarios from historical events with toys, they might be, become more approachable for audiences such as children, as long as you explain to them what it's all about, so it's not fantasy, which this is based on something else. Here you can see collecting. Multiples of ponies. And customization of ponies. And uh, this is something very interesting, a case study of a male doll who loves to wear dresses called Ken of Finland <laughs> and his relationship with Hector and um, it's a continuous narrative about identity play, world playing, photo play, storytelling and social play. Also toy activism because uh, Ken of Finland joins the pride uh, parades and, and 
and buys a ton of Finland merchandise for Hector, who is a fan. So I love that aspect of reality that becomes a part of the play. And yes, I've done uh, some research on Star Wars as well, and research is coming out. And this is an interesting case of play for, uh, where play and labor mix and, and where uh, the fans of Star Wars are playing but also constantly creating materials that um, can be used as marketing tools by the companies. So the findings, uh, summaries on, um, a summary on adult toy play, it's about collecting, customizing, creating stories, cosplaying, communicating, etc. And it's both domestic, public, hidden, perceived, ephemeral, documented, physical, digital, and hybrid, solitary, social, consumed, created, leisurely, flavor-oriented, fantastic, uh, such as escaping the realism, uh, but towards realistic as well, recreating, remembering, playing out, replaying the past. And I'm very much an advocate towards this adult toy play theme, as you have probably already sensed from my presentation. Um, play is for everyone. And once again, if you wonder about uh, how you're going to use this on your uh, crea creation, the aspects or dimensions of the toy experience were the following. The um, physical, fictional, functional and affective, and what I've written in the boxes are examples of how they emerge in each of these dimensions. So physicality of the toy, fictionality is uh, its relationship to storytelling, obviously, the functionality aspect we already covered, uh, affective, the emotional connection with the plaything. So, also, we could use this here. To conclude, Sutton Smith says, as I have said, in our world, religion promotes the possibility of eternity and sex promotes the possibility of offspring, but play promotes the immediate liveliness of being alive and keeps us emotionally vibrant and capable of joy in an otherwise hostile and scary world. Beautiful thought, I think. And he continues somewhere in the book as well. Life, it seems, always becomes more exciting when the hope of play exists. Now it's time to open your eyes. Thanks, Avicca. Thank you.